I think this subject needs to be, you know, done, you know, uh, slowly and try to get understanding so we can be strengthened and helped. I'm really glad that Brother Endress had the, the foresight to see that we could put together a, a group of lessons to help the church and its family. And I really, there's been a lot of feedback uh, from these lessons and the time we've, and it's been a lot of good feedback that people feel like they have gained a lot in their families. One of the things I think it's, that's really nice is you hear things like this. We started working on some things in our home right away. I've heard that several times. And what's nice is if you can hear something and not just say amen to it, but it, you're able to put it into practice. You're able to put it into a practice. So make sure, ushers, that we all, that everybody has, has one. Out on the uh, welcome stand, if you have uh, misplaced one or whatever you like, there's there's extras of part one and part two out there on the uh, welcome stand. So if you've misplaced one, you'd like to just put all three of them together. Feel free to do that. Grab up. And if you have, if we happen to run out of those back there um, that are on the stand. Let me know and I can produce some more if you'd like to have one of the parts. A lot of people, what they like to do is just take them and put them together and keep them somewhere to, for another reference. How many of you have three ring binders at home? Three ring binders. You can, you can punch holes in these, a lot of these kinds of lessons and lay them into uh, one of those three ring binders. And uh, you'd be surprised how much you accumulate over the years or even months of different uh, teaching materials that's handed out. All right. I think we're all ready. Anybody? Raise your hand if you didn't get one. Okay. Let's ask God to help us tonight. In the name of Jesus, God, we ask you, Lord, to help us in this building. God, every heart and every mind, God, that we'd understand what you're trying to say to us and help us, Lord Jesus, to have our families, Lord, centered upon you, Jesus, the rock, Christ Jesus. And Lord, give us understanding tonight. Give us wisdom tonight. Help us, Lord, with simplicity and clarity to declare your word in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Part three, the beginning title here says, One Purpose, One Flesh, One Story. Have you ever really seen before in households um, it's as if there is multiple stories going on inside of one house and here's what I mean by that the husband or dad whoever he may be he goes off and does all the things he wants to do mama she goes off and she does all the things she wants to do there's even a lot of times that the money is even divided up and he says, this is my money. I'll do with it what I want. I earned it. And the woman says, this is my money. I'll do with it what I want. They have divided bank accounts. They have divided lives. They have divided times away from each other. They all, you know, it's almost like if you look and, and say, what's the story in that house? You'd say, well, there isn't one. There's gobs of stories going on. There's two or three stories when it comes to husband and wife you may have two different stories that are taking place that's something that in the christian home doesn't work very well it doesn't work very well for the man to just go do his thing and the woman just to go do her thing and they meet every now and then say hi to one another and and move on down the line that's not a very healthy home you'll notice the health comes is when we follow the true principles of the Word of God. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam. That's the first man that God created from the dust of the ground. He caused Adam to fall asleep, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and then closed up the flesh instead thereof. So God reaches in and actually takes a rib out. So this is the first surgery, right? First surgery, God takes the rib out 
And verse 22 says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man. Now notice, taken from the man. He took it from the man and he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now, what did he say? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman. Now why? Why, why is she called woman? It says because she was taken out of man. So that's what the woman is about right there. That's the key of understanding. She was taken out of man. The rib was taken, created a woman, and then presented back to the man. So he says, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, I love verse 24. There's no debate here. No debate. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Look at that. When a man and woman join together in marriage, they become how many? They become one. So what happens if you divide one? If you divide one, you get a fraction. So once you're joined, keep that in mind. You're one flesh. Notice in verse 24, and this is one of the, the principles of home and the family that you have to get right away. When you're first married, it's a difficult process because what you're doing is you're taking a husband, you're taking a wife, and you're actually leaving your families to join together to start a new family. And you've never done it before, so those that, that get married for the, you know, you're married for the first time, a lot of times you're younger. It can be a difficult process because what you're doing is you are leaving. Now, notice what the Word says. That's what God wanted us to do, to leave father and mother. Not stay attached to them in such a way where they dictate your life. And this is a very healthy concept and principle to get into the family early. If somebody from the outside, if, even if it's a father-in-law, mother-in-law, if they're trying to dictate your family, you need to kindly tell them no. You need to tell them no. Thank God for godly parents that understand to release their children and let them start a family. And if they need help, they can call up mom and dad and say, Dad, I got a situation. I just need some advice. There's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, that's a good thing. It's even a good thing for us, back and forth. All, look at all of us in here that are dads. There are times that we can collaborate, even as, even as fellow dads and fellow moms. We can collaborate a lot of times and talk about things and say, hey, Dad, uh, how did you handle this situation when your kid was younger, when the, you had a teenager? You might say, well, let me give you some advice. Here's, here's what I did. Here's the things that I did. And you go, oh, that's, thank you very much. I thank God for the men of God that can be a strength to one another and, and really the whole church that can strengthen one another in our family relationships. There's nothing wrong with, with us collaborating and helping one another, but there's a there's a, there's a situation that you will find where there are parents that try to run the lives of those people that are in their own family. That should not be. It really should not be. If you have a mother-in-law or father-in-law, there's always jokes about mother-in-law, right? Mother-in-law, father-in-law, all those jokes, but you know, there's a lot of truth to them. There's a really a lot of truth. They can become so meddlesome in what you're trying to accomplish that you can't even develop your own family. And there's nothing wrong with developing your own family deals and your own times together. Hey, if our family wants to go off and do something together, that's cool. I don't have to have my mom's approval. I'm thankful that my mother is not that way. She's, I have to actually insist that she meddles a little bit because she just leaves us alone. 
But she would never do that to anybody. But I thank God for that. I thank God I don't have that situation to deal with. And I'm thankful that there are people that understand that you have to leave your mom and dad and start your own family. Now, that word may be a huge help to somebody here tonight. Somebody may be struggling. What you need to do is go to your in-laws or whoever it is that's trying to make, you know, try to run your life. We'll put it that way. Trying to run your life. You just need to distance yourself. That doesn't mean that you hate your mom and dad. Not at all. It just means if, if there's one of them that want to meddle in your life and tell you what to do all the time, you just need to start cutting her down, shutting it off and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, you know, this is our family. I've heard of stories of, of people that the moms and the dads, they get ticked off at their kids if the kids want to do something, say, for example, like at a holiday. Have you ever heard of that? Where you have a family unit and they say, well, we're going to go do something and, and the mom and the dad over here get mad at them because they want to do something. Well, that's, that's pretty immature. That's one of the most immature things you can do is start dictating to your kids that they're trying to start a family over here. Leave them alone. Really, leave them alone. Let them develop their stuff. Let them have a family. Let them develop what they're going to do. You don't always, now, if you guys like to get together, if everybody says, well, we're going to get together at a holiday, that's not what I'm talking about. There's nothing wrong with that. Getting, matter of fact, getting together with your family is a good thing. But when you understand what I'm trying to say is when somebody's trying to dictate in and run your life and run your family, that's when you have to cut it off and say no. There is husbands and wives, going back to what I first said, there are husbands and wives that have two different stories. When it comes to a Christian household, there should be one story that's being written in that house. That wife and that husband, they should be together. Somebody says, well, the kids need to get... If, listen, if the husband and the wife are together, the kids will be with them. You'll find that to be true. It's when you have a wife or you have a husband that says, I want to do my own thing. Well, then, why did you get married? Why did you get married if you want to do your own thing? If you want to do your own thing, remember that before you ever get married and stay unmarried. Now, I suppose there are people that have stayed unmarried. And I have no problem with that if they don't feel like that they want to intertwine their lives. There's some people that don't get married because they want to do the work of God in a, in a more deeper way or in a more consecrated way. Really. There's nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong with somebody that doesn't count the cost before they get married. And then after they get married, they make it very difficult on that spouse because they never see him. Or they never get the understanding that they're with them. Let's take the husband, for example. Let's say the husband decides to, to move the family in this direction in a spiritual way. And the wife doesn't want to go. And so she puts hindrances upon the man. Listen to me. If we have a Christian home, if we have Holy Ghost-filled moms and dads here, we shouldn't have a pulling in two directions. Mom and dad ought to be going in the same direction. They should have the same purpose and they should have the same story. I don't want to write a different story than my wife. I don't, I don't desire that at all. I want us to write our story together. And I have a daughter, some of you have children, and when they get, what we're doing with our children is this, we're not teaching them to stay with us. We're teaching them, little by little, to be released. That's a real key to good child rearing, is develop over time. When they're, when they're first born, you've got to start thinking, I'm going to have to release this child one day. One of these days, I'm going to have to release this boy. One of these days, I'm going to have to release this girl. And if I do, I, I know I'm going to be teaching them and training them a little different than just trying to keep them infantile. I don't want to keep my child infantile. I want them to grow up. I want them to learn things. I want to keep backing off and letting them experience and letting them learn. And like we said the other night, 
Our children have to be evangelized. We have to talk to them about being filled with the Holy Ghost and true repentance in their life and walking with God and, and keeping your eyes off of the world. We need to teach them that. Not just demand it, but we need to also show it that we're living that way too. So our children, it's very important that we understand that as we go on in time, we're releasing our children. By the time they get to around the neighborhood of you know 18 to 25, most of them are probably going to leave the house. They're going to get married. They're going to move on. And you know what? That's good. That's good. Really, it is. It's good. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with, with teaching your kids when they're starting to come up. One of these days, you're out of here, you know, not, not in a mean way. But, you know, you're going to be an adult, and you're going to need to start a family, and you're going to need to do the work of God. Find a good spouse and do the work of God. I don't want you hanging around with me. Matter of fact, one of the things that we've learned about young men when we grow up, and I was one myself, about the time you get into your teens and you start moving up 15, 16, all of a sudden you realize that you and dad, oh boy. It's like there's two dads in this house. You know? And there really isn't two dads. But you know God designed it that way? God designed young men when they get into their teens to start to feel the sense of responsibility and authority. And they, they feel that naturally. They really do. But don't worry about it. Just teach them good spirit and a good attitude. Because God's just really developed them so they can be a what? To be a dad. To be a husband. That's what he's developed them to be. And you'll find out if you have sons, as they get older, it's like you want them out of there. You know? Dallas, you're out. <laughs> you're out sooner than you thought, buddy. Many of our children today are hampered when they get to the age of 18 or so forth because they never had a good role model and they never had somebody be a good dad to them. They never saw it at all. Some of them never saw a good mom at all. That's a sad shame. And that's why you have people that are coming out and they're immature and they, they don't worry about their sexual activity. They'll sleep with people all over the place. They don't realize what destruction they're, they're, they're bringing on themselves and other people. And it's a big joke to a lot of them. It really is. But why? They didn't have the proper bringing up. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, let me tell you, many of the people that we meet, many of the people that are going to come into the church over the next few years don't have any kind of good standards in their life from a dad or a mom. And they think it's funny. A lot of them do. They say, oh, well, we don't need... Listen, that's why we're here, folks. Let's develop good, strong families in the church of Jesus Christ so that they have a model to look to. Really, they need a good model to look to when they come into the church. Somebody said, well, I was messed up, but you don't have to stay messed up. Find somebody around you that really does have a good family life. And there's no such thing as perfect, so don't even look for that. But somebody that, has, somebody that has a good family life, look for them and say, then just watch them. Watch what they do. You'd be amazed what you can learn by watching a good dad. Just watch a good dad and watch what he does. Watch how he handles things. Watch a good mom. Watch how she handles things. Church, we, that's what we need desperately in this world. Oh, we need it so desperately in the United States of America. In Green Bay, we need it desperately. We need good families. And I pray to God that these lessons and the time we're spending on this will be a very valuable thing for us. That as we go on, now, once again, just a little summary here. We've got to be very careful that we don't hamper newlyweds. If you, if you have them, if you are a mom and dad that have newlyweds, release them. Please release them. And if you're a newlywed, you do have to have contact with your family. I understand that. There's nothing wrong with it. But don't always run to back to your family for advice all the time about your marriage. I'll tell you why. Because they don't know. There's only two people that know about your marriage. That's you and your spouse. 
like I've told a lot of people, when I first got married, you have to use yourself if you're speaking. When we first got married, I was 29 when I got married. 29. Think about that. My wife was 32. Both of us had never been married before. Both of us just kind of like gave up. <laughs> and then one day I saw her. And oh boy, did the sparks fly. I am serious. If you'd have turned the lights out, there would have been sparks arcing between us. You know? It was that, it was that kind of a thing. Because we just kind of looked at each other and were like, it scared me so bad she couldn't find me for three months. <laughs> I'm serious. You ask her. Where is she? She's not even here to defend herself. <sighs> oh, she can watch her. <laughs> All right. So we were older, and, and one of the things that I've told when we talk about marriage is that we bought us a brand new couch. And I think Brother and Sister Lehman have it in her basement right now. We gave it away last year sometime because we bought something different. And that couch we wore out. And everybody laughs when I say that, but we wore it out, and here's how we did it. I sat at one end. She sat at the other. We put our feet together in the middle. And we just sat there and talked and talked and talked. Why? Why did we do that? Because we needed to bring uh, ourselves together. Now, if she would have run over the phone every time we had an issue and called up somebody and says, oh, uh, we got problems in our, our relationship. We got problems in our marriage. You know what would have happened? Nothing would have gotten improved. They don't know. There's two people that can work out their marriage issues. The two people that are married just sit down and start talking. Just sit down and start. Don't get everybody else involved. You and your spouse sit down and ask Jesus to come in the room and start talking. Because if you start getting outside help, you get all kinds, those, then they'll have to run through everything. Okay, now, what did he say? And what did she say? And what he, you're the only two that really know. There are times, there are times that you just can't get anywhere. You may need to go to somebody you can trust. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't do that every week. Don't be running to somebody every week. Sit down and work it out. We wore that couch out in that first year. We just sat there and talked and talked and talked, and we developed a real understanding with one another over that first year. And boy, did we struggle. Did anybody else struggle when you first got married? Did anybody still struggling? You know what happens if you're still struggling when you get back into the struggle? That means you're probably not talking. You're probably not talking anymore. You need to sit down again. Start talking. Start working through it. Start talking about how you feel. If your children watch you as parents work it out, what do you think they're going to do when they get older and they get married? They're going to work it out. They're going to learn how to work it out. The reason why a lot of people don't want to write one story is because they don't want to spend the time blending their lives together. And if they'll spend the time blending their lives together, they'll write one story. Not two different things. I don't want to write, I don't want to just go do my, all my stuff and my wife go do all of her stuff. Some guys, they just say, well, my wife just does what she wants. I don't worry about it. Some gals, they can never see their husband. He plays softball on Wednesday. He bowls on Saturday. He does this on this day. He fishes on this day. He does this, and he's never around. 
Never. A Christian home doesn't operate that way. A Christian home operates together. Now, I know this may seem like a foreign language because our world is not designed to be family-oriented. Our world is designed to be institutionalized and divided and everything spread out. All the men go this way, all the women go this way, all the kids go this way, and all the youth go this way. And if you're elderly, I feel sorry for you. But there's a whole lot of us going there one day. They need respect. Those folks need honor. Some of our older men that have been pastors before, maybe they're just too weak to do it, we need to hear their voices again. Some saints that have been around for a while and have been through some cycles and been through some issues, we need to hear their voice again. They're not just a bunch of whiteheads that just need to be relegated to a back seat and throw an afghan over them and just tell them to be quiet. That's not what God intended. Do you realize the wisdom that can come from them? Do you realize the stuff that we can... Do you realize that some of these people had marriages that lasted 50 years and 60 years and they may be a widow or a widower and you think they could tell us a few things? Might not be a bad idea to put your arm around some older gentleman that's been married for quite a few years and say, I love you, brother. Is there anything you can say to me to give me a boost here tonight? Anything you can say to me? Anything you've observed in my life that you can help me with? Isn't that neat when you get that attitude of submission? I believe that there are some words of wisdom that are being held back by some of our elderly people because they're afraid that it won't be received because nobody's asking them. Let's reverse that trend and let's include everybody that lives and breathes. Let's include them all. Amen. One purpose, one flesh. God didn't intend for a husband and wife to be joined together to be divided. He intended for them to become one flesh. So husbands, we need to say to our wives, Honey, we need to be one in purpose. And one story needs to be written in this house. Let's work together to make that happen. Now, you realize the investment that you're going to have to make. The investment is time, effort, forgiveness. How many of you realize that a marriage has got to have the forgiveness issue in it constantly? You've got to have forgiveness. You've got to keep inserting it. Because you can start to develop over the years a grudge in your spirit with your spouse. It can happen with anybody. You can start to develop grudges and, and then you'll notice that you're starting to feel hindered in everything that you do spiritually. That's because there's unforgiveness boiling down below. Sometimes that old dude that you're married to, he didn't do it right. Sometimes that gal that you married, that pretty gal, over the years she's starting to get under your skin. You know, this happens to us, but we're going to have to learn to do what? Get our forgetter out. Say, Jesus, I'm going, to, I'm going to have to forgive. And go on. Patch it up and go on. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes talking. In Jesus' name. The next section is Ephesians. There's Ephesians 5.21. Let's read down through this. Notice the image over here on the right where it shows Jesus Christ, the head of the church, shows the husband, the head of the wife, and then the body is the church, which is subject to the head, and the wife is subject to her husband, which is her head. Now, this is the model that God set up, and this is the way it really works best. Verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, 
Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the what? 